So I'm going to clue you in on a few things if you don't know, but right now I am preaching up here with wet feet because a good portion of the building flooded about two hours ago. And so if you're wondering why that part of the building is closed down, it's because we had burst pipes and powers cut off in places. Thus, I was also not able to print out my message to you, and so you're going to see me pull up my notes from my laptop today. But hey, it's Christmas, right? Things don't go right, do they? It's a bit chaotic sometimes, isn't it? Things don't always go the way that we plan, which is no different really than the first Christmas when things didn't go the way that anybody had planned. Now, around here for the last several weeks, we have been exploring the idea that Jesus is our Emmanuel. And that's what Christmas is really all about, isn't it? And I know that there are a lot of other wonderful things about Christmas. I look around the room and I see some of those. Some of you are dressed so festive and representing all the, the lights and the colors of Christmas. And I'm here for it. I love the whole season. We were decorating gingerbread houses in our home earlier today. I, I, I love the smells of Christmas. Uh, we've got peppermint and we've got cookies, uh, the baking of bread and gingerbread. I love the way it smells when you have a nice fire in your fireplace. I, I love the traditions that come with Christmas, the singing of Christmas carols, the wrapping of packages and all of the things that we often do at this time of year. I, I love the songs, at least most of them. Some of them I'm a little tired of by the time Christmas rolls around, the ones that we hear on the radio, it seems like every five minutes. I love the fact that at this time of year, people travel and go and spend time with people who are dear to them. That's a big deal. I love that. I love the lights. Do you lo who loves Christmas lights in the room? You don't sound like it. I mean, you raised your hand, but <laughs> kids, I expected a little more from you on that. Who loves gifts? Man, I love gifts. I'm, here. I'm not ashamed to say that I love gifts. I love buying gifts for people. I love watching them unwrap gifts. And I love receiving gifts. Sometimes the anticipation of giving a good gift is even better than getting one yourself. We've started a tradition in our home that, that I love. And this year, was it Thanksgiving night? Thanksgiving night, we draw names, and each person draws the name of somebody else in the family, and that's the person that we have to make a gift for. Um, as I love the traditions around Christmas. There's six of us, so we drew names, and, and we give those gifts on Christmas Eve. And so when we get home tonight, we're going to have a nice meal together. We're going to gather around the tree, and the gifts, the homemade gifts that we made for each other uh, will be open. Last year... I received beard oil um, and, and homemade aftershave, wonderful stuff, and it smells so good on my face. I use it every week. I love Christmas movies. Everybody, on the count of three, I want you to yell out the name of your favorite Christmas movie. One, two, three. That's what I thought. Okay. We're in agreement. It's a Wonderful Life is everyone's favorite in the room. I, I love Christmas movies. We got any fans of White Christmas in the house? Love White Christmas. How about It's a Wonderful Life? Nobody can dislike It's a Wonderful Life. Like, it, not if you have a soul. Like, you have to love that movie. A Muppet's Christmas Carol? All right, that's, my, that's, that's one of my favorites. And then, of course, Elf. And I know everybody in the room loves Elf. But more than all of the music, more than all of the songs... More than all of the treats, more than all of the gifts, I love that one word, Emmanuel. I, I, I love Emmanuel. I love that the world seems to, and even so many people who do not believe in Jesus at Christmas, attention turns. And the gaze of the world, at least many in the world, turn to our Emmanuel, this one inescapable truth. 
that he came. That Jesus really came. We've read the Christmas story tonight together. Um, and haven't these families done a great job coming up here and reading the Christmas story? Amen. <laughs> Wonderful. We've read the story, and I would like to spend just a few minutes rereading you a part of it and then talking about a very special part of the story, some characters from the story that are so easy to overlook, and we're oftentimes probably overlooked in the days surrounding Jesus' birth. So, back in the book of Luke, here's what we read. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were, they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, that you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. These shepherds were tending their flocks outside of the small village of Bethlehem. And pronounced in Hebrew, the word is Bethlehem. The name of that village where Jesus was born means house of bread. Though Bethlehem at the time was a Jewish town, and it was a Jewish town throughout biblical history, today the city of Bethlehem is predominantly Muslim. It's a beautiful town. Some of us will travel there together in a few months. Uh, it was a year ago uh, that, that I was there and was able to sit and think and pray and ponder and just imagine the night that Jesus came to be with us. In a few moments, we're going to take communion together, um, and, and I promised you that I, you were going to receive what I feel like is a very special gift, and on the communion trays all around the room in front of you and even up in the balcony for those of you are small wooden cups that were carved from olive wood right there that grew outside of Bethlehem, and so you get to take those home with you, and I want you to put that somewhere long after tonight. Every time you look at it, I don't want you to just think about communion, I want you to think about the one word Emmanuel, that Jesus came, and yes, he came to die on the cross, but Jesus came to be God with us. Sadly, the number of Christians in Bethlehem today um, is very, very small. In 1947, the Christian population of Bethlehem accounted for 86% of its residents, but by 2016, that number declined to less than 12%. Today, it is even less than that in the town of Bethlehem. So these shepherds there, aside from the animals in the stable, were the literal first witnesses to the birth of Jesus. And many times we say that the reason the angels came to the shepherds is because God doesn't care about wealth. And we'll say that God came just to the normal, average, everyday people like many of us. That God isn't interested in power or prestige. And that's true. And I do believe that was important to him. Because if it wasn't true, then where would the angels have shown up first to announce the birth of Christ? Maybe in a palace. Maybe he would have shown up to announce the birth of Jesus to, <coughs> excuse me, the Pharisees or the Sanhedrin. Maybe who'd have shown up? The angels would have shown up to announce the birth of the king to some Roman rulers. No, no, he didn't do that. And we know that God is not impressed by what we have or he's put off by what we don't have. We know that's true, but I believe there's more to it than just that. I believe that the shepherds are such a vital part of the Christmas story because in the world that they lived in, the shepherds would have played such a vital role, not only in the life of Israel, but that very word shepherd would play such a vital role in the life and the ministry of that baby who was born and placed in a manger in Bethlehem. I want to share with you just a couple of truths about first century shepherds in Bethlehem. Shepherding was woven into the fabric of the nation of Israel. 
all the way back. You can go all the way back to the book of Genesis, and you'll discover that the first patriarch, Abraham, was a man who was also a shepherd, and his sons behind them uh, had many, many sheep. And that's a picture of Jesus all the way there. That he not only came from the line of Abraham and his descendants, but Jesus was before them, and he was for them as well. Sheep herding was not the most (coughs) job in a family. When a father had boys, the youngest boy would eventually take over those duties when he was old enough to be the caretaker of the sheep. And we see this in the life of who in the Old Testament? David, that's exactly right. It was David's older brothers who were away at war while he was there tending those few sheep. It was a low position. It was important. And it was important to the family, but it wasn't valued. And again, that's a picture of Jesus. Jesus said that he came to do what? To serve. Not to be served. He lowered himself to get on our level. Shepherds had to take care of sheep. That's what makes you a shepherd, obviously. Sheep, you may be aware, are very, very stupid animals. They get stuck in bushes. They get stuck in cracks in the ground. And a good shepherd would tend to his wounded sheep. And sometimes that would mean binding up a wound. Other times that would mean fighting off a predator. Oftentimes that would mean actually anointing the sheep's head with oil. Uh, 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 the oil that a shepherd would smear onto the head of the sheep would protect the sheep from disease and parasites that eventually could even cause blindness. A good shepherd takes care of his sheep. And I, I think by the angels coming to the shepherds first outside of Bethlehem, I think God is trying to give a clue to the world. Uh, I think he's trying to clue us in on a secret that he has always known. I think God is giving people a sneak peek into the kind of Messiah that Jesus really was. That he's the with us God. The Emmanuel God. He, he's with his sheep. What, what a picture, again, of Jesus. A Savior who heals. A Savior who, who cleans us up. A Savior who blesses us with oil and binds up our wounds. There's one more picture that I'd like to give you. On the hills outside of Bethlehem, you'll find, even to this day, low rock walls. And in Jesus' day, in the days that these shepherds were out tending their flocks, you would find these, these low rock walls all out in the field surrounding Bethlehem, and these rock walls, if you can imagine, would have had three complete sides. And so it would form almost like a a, a U-shape or a big horseshoe. And the back wall would be complete, and the side walls would be complete. But on the front of that box shape of rocks, the wall wouldn't be complete. And you and I know... That a fence that isn't complete all the way around is not a very good fence, is it? How many of you have fences for one reason or another? What do we use those fences for? They're really used for two things, primarily. Number one, to keep things you like inside the fence. And to keep things you don't like, where? Outside the fence. So if you have chickens, you want to keep the chickens on which side of the fence? Inside the fence, and which side of the fence do you want to keep raccoons and foxes on? Outside the fence. If you have a dog, you want to keep your dog on the inside of the fence. If you have cattle, you would prefer that your cattle would be inside the fence. If you have a horse, all right, we, we could do this all day long. Things that you like, things that you've invested in, things that matter to you, you want them inside the fence, and things that could hurt the things that you value, You want them outside of the fence. So a fence with three sides is not a very good fence, is it? It's really not a fence at all. Just a couple of walls out in the middle of a field. Well, when a shepherd would take his flock and push them into that sheep pen, that's what a sheep pen was, 
when they would push them into the sheep pen at night. These were not, these were not unintelligent people that didn't know how to complete a fence. No, they, they would push their flock into the pen, but then there was a gap, usually about four feet to six feet, on the front of that fence, and the shepherd himself would then sit down or lay down in the gap, thus completing the pen. Nothing is going to get in to harm the sheep, that if something wants to get in and take one of the sheep, they're going to have to go through the shepherd. A sheep is not going to be able to wander off in the middle of the night. If they do, they're going to have to go through the shepherd. Jesus, many years after his birth, says to a group of people in John chapter 10. Here's what it says. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And everybody listening to this back then would have said, Oh, oh, I know what picture you're painting here. Just like a shepherd would be the door or the gate for the sheep pen, here Jesus is saying to all of these people, I'm the door of the sheep. He says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door, is what Jesus said. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. He says, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And then Jesus finished with this statement. I am the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Do you see it? Jesus says, I am the door. And just like a good shepherd provides safety and protects his flock, that that, that shepherd, those shepherds out there in Bethlehem on the night Jesus was born, is a a reflection of the good shepherd. He says, I am the door. In other words, all of those years before Jesus had said this, when angels lit up a hillside on the outskirts of Bethlehem, they were proclaiming that the one who had just been born would be for them what they were attempting to be for their sheep. That Jesus came. He came to be the with us God. He came that we might enter into life through him, into something wonderful that never, ever ends. Many years later, Jesus would gather with friends that he would lay down his life for, just like he said. And today we gather on Christmas Eve. And every year that we celebrate Christmas, we do so to celebrate that God came as a baby. Not just that God came as a baby, but that God came as a baby for you and for me. But that baby came with the purpose of laying his life down for us. He died to take away our sins. The Emmanuel that came to be with us came to be with us so that we could one day be with him and with his father. He came to shepherds 2,000 years ago and he came to you and I in the Christmas of 2022. And if you have believed on that, if you have put your faith in him, and have trusted in him. Scripture teaches that you and I can have what he talked about in John chapter 10. Life abundantly. Life that is never ending. So before we take communion here in a moment. And we practice open communion. And so whether this is your home church or whether you're visiting We want you to come and participate as long as you're a follower of Jesus and have placed your faith and trust in him. But if tonight you've come to this Christmas Eve celebration and you've not done that, could I just ask you, what would be a better time of giving your life to Jesus than right now? So I'm going to ask us all around the room, heads bowed, eyes closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just very simply, if you want to give your life to Jesus, 
If you want to give your life to the God who came for you and you believe what the Bible teaches about him, you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, and that he died a death on a cross to pay the penalty for your sins. Could I encourage you right now in your own words to reach out in prayer? This is the God who would not stay dead. Do you believe it? The Bible says if you believe it and call upon the name of the Lord, then you can be saved. So in your own words, would you just pray to him, inviting him into your life? turning from your sin and selfishness and ask Him to come in and change you. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the opportunity that we have before us. We thank You for the opportunity we have to take the bread, to take the cup, to remember what You have done for us. To remember that the real reason you came was to save us. And so God, we do say thank you. We love you. In the name of your son Jesus, our wonderful Savior, we pray. And God's people said together, amen.